As this relates to medicine, though, um, the idea that Einstein's genius uh, might be explained by his extraordinary brain, but might also be influenced by maybe there's more to the brain than just the flesh and blood part. Maybe there's a soul, and we would call that dualism, right? Yeah. Versus materialism, where materialism is we can attribute everything to physical flesh and blood, and dualism says they're separate. And it may be that we won't know exactly about how to, where thoughts come from and all those kind of things at this point in our time. We're I agree. Can't even, we can't even fathom them, really. We're not even close. Um, but I mean, you know, inherent, when you, when you write a book about somebody's brain and you know a great deal about his mind, um, you wonder, can one explain the other? Now, I mean, my, my pat answer on this is, I make my living as a materialist in the sense that as a neurologist, I know if there's something wrong with the right or the left side of your brain, your right, you're going to lose dexterity in your right hand. And if it's near your speech area, you're going to have an aphasia. You're not going to talk the way you normally would. So you go, well, there it is, brain, mind. But when you talk about these other kind of abstractions, that's, there's really, it's, you, you know, how you come up with general relativity, you know, how you perceive the color red. Um, we're not at that point. We can't look at brain tissue and tell you how, what David Chalmers, who's a neurophilosopher at NYU, talks about the hard question, how a chunk of brain produces what you and I would call a thought or a sensation of red. We don't know. And we all kind of get sucked into this, you know, um, functional neuroimaging. You know, if you see something, if you're reading, uh, reading something, the left side of your brain, the angular gyrus will light up, those kind of things, and you go, well, there it is, you see? Well, that's the easy question. That just says you that circuit is lighting up, it's increasing its metabolism when you perform this particular mental task, but you really don't know how it does it in that, in that piece of chunk of brain. So if, you, if I can't answer the hard question and show you how you know, s several grams of brain produce the color red, you're entitled to say, well, maybe it's not materialism. Maybe there is dualism. Maybe there is a substance, there's a separate substances. Now, the neurophilosophers go, well, this is substance dualism, that the brain substance and the spirit, consciousness, soul substance are totally different substances. Now, that creates a whole other problem. It's like, well, how do you explain a substance that's not a physical substance? Yeah. You know, and we're not at that point. But that's dualism. And, you know, I prefer to stay an agnostic on this. I, 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 you know, if someone answers the hard question for me, okay, well, now maybe we're going to talk about materialism. But, you know, either maybe, you know, maybe consciousness, soul, thought is something s materially different than the human brain. Or, alternatively, we're just not smart enough to figure out how the brain works. If we could really drill down, maybe we could say, okay, now I, the circuitry is such as I can see how you can perceive consciousness, thought, things like that. So it's up for grabs. And that book, as much as I love writing it, you're not going to get the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to get the answer. You know, that's a, a problem we face every day in medicine, is things that are supposed to happen don't always happen the way they should, and people... How many stories can you, can you tell us, or I can tell you, that things don't turn out the way they should? I mean, people should die and then they don't, or, or you do everything right and it turns out wrong, and you say, I don't know. I just don't know how that happened. There's some magic to this, or, you know, or whatever. You know, you take 4.6 billion years since the first single cell. Deep time, that's not the, I, and I talk about deep time, but I mean, that's not even close. But to evolve a biological structure where it evolves, elaborates, retrenches, throws away some things, adds on. And then at the end of it, you know, supposedly we're the pinnacle, supposedly human beings, or maybe, maybe, the, maybe the whales are smarter. Who knows? But I mean, you know, we've gone, I mean, in, just in my field, you know, you talk about neurons. That's our building block of the brain. The neuron was established, was it 1907, in terms of uh, uh, Ramon y Cajal and Golgi, and they were fighting over whether the neuron was discrete or was a part of a greater interconnected network. I mean, so you're talking about 110 years that we've learned about the basic building block. So 
we, we haven't been slouches for the past century, but we are a long way. Well, that's what I mean. There's a lot about medicine that is that we don't know. And we practice, we're not as scientific as we think we always are. And, you know, sometimes there's a lot of intuitiveness or luck or whatever it is. Art, art as art, well as science. Maybe it's art. Maybe that's what we're talking about, art yeah. and science. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I hope we, you know, it's, we all welcome the science if, if, if it says, oh, really? Should I be using, um, you know, 81 milligrams of aspirin or would it be better with 30 or 125? You know, you can't intuit it. You do the studies and then there's a certain limit on the studies because, you know, you, you can't be doing a study on the 30 milligrams of aspirin. You know, you'd be doing a study on aspirin every, every 10 years to figure out the optimal dose. You know, there's a certain amount you have limited resources, but, but we all sort of know if there's a vascular issue, aspirin might help a patient.